Geek Insider presents Geeky, Cheeky, and Downright Freaky with Matthew Harris. He's taking a closer look at some of the wonderfully weird, gloriously geeky, and freaky, freaky things in our world. Good evening, everybody, and or afternoon, morning, whatever the case may be. Welcome to Geeky, Cheeky, and Downright Freaky. I am your host, Matthew Harris. If you tuned into this show on the live YouTube feed, uh, you probably noticed there were some audio issues and some connectivity issues, and so we wanted to redo this for the podcast, and tonight's guest is Jackie Sonnenberg. She is an author, and she's got some really unique books and characters that definitely fall in line with the Geeky, Cheeky, and Downright Freaky uh, format. Um, she has written for multiple Chicago area newspapers, such as the Daily Herald, the Chicago Tribune, and the New Sun. But she's also the author of The Little Dog Laughed, which is about a, uh, a horrible secret and a wealthy vampire home. And the only one that knows the secret is desperate to keep it hidden. And it's also the book's also been touted as Flowers in the Attic Meets Vampires. She also has a young adult collection, and I'm going to get her to say the collection name because I still hadn't got it right. And with y- y'all know how I am with them rolling the R's and all that stuff with this southern accent, it just doesn't work real well. But um, she uh, she reimagines some classic nursery rhymes as horror stories, and she's known for also known for making original costumes for her original characters and introducing readers to her books in the best way possible by bringing her characters to life. And with titles like The Lamb Was Sure To and My Soul To Keep, you can bet that these are some interesting characters to say the least. Um, Let me just real quick before we bring her in, you can take a look at some of the characters that she's done. Now that one is one of her more tame ones because then there's For The Lamb Was Sure To Go. And this one she'll tell us about a little bit more. And then we have this one, which was in her anthology. And as you can see, she puts a lot of thought and work into these characters. This isn't just something she throws together. And so, ladies and gentlemen, help me welcome Miss Jackie Sonnenberg. Jackie, welcome to the show. Hello, Matthew. How are you? I am doing great, man. Thank you so much for sticking around and uh, redoing the, the broadcast. We wanted to get... Uh, you know, make sure that the audience got a, a full view and a few, uh, full listen to what you bring to the table because you do bring some unique books and unique takes on classic tales that we're used to, and uh, you kind of twist them up. Oh, yeah. It's, it's a lot of fun. You know, there, there really is a market for retellings. I mean, we see a lot of fairy tale retellings. I've seen Oz and Wonderland done. I wanted to do something a little bit different. So that's where this came into play. Perfect. And, you know, I just showed the, the audience several of your characters there. And uh, we talked about this earlier, but which one was your most favorite at the cons? Well, I have to say, I have a lot of fun when I do Mary and the Lamb, uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, number one, people are already drawn to them because they're very iconic. Mary and the Lamb, people know who they are. They're going to see that right away, um, but they're not exactly going to figure out what's going on here until they <laughs> approach me and they find out with gestures, of course, of communication, because you've seen the picture, my version of Mary uh, doesn't have a mouth there. She actually has a mouth on the back of her head. And so I have a latex prosthetic piece on my mouth when I'm married. So the only thing I can do is gesture, you know, wave or stand there and stare at people and then hand out flyers. So that character doesn't talk. And you, you told me when we first met that that was your most brilliant creation because <laughs> You didn't have to explain anything about your characters. You just stood there. And I, I take it she was a pretty popular character as well. You know, it, it's almost like nothing really needed to be said. The character spoke for her, herself. And the Flyers, of course, explained what was going on. And, of course, I have, I have book copies with me wherever I go, no matter what character I am and whatever book I'm promoting at the time. The, the, the Flyers are there for a reason. They explain who this is and what they're doing and where people can learn more about them. Very cool. Very cool. And it's such a a unique way of marketing. Um, You know, every 
author that, that is publishing their books, they, they're, they have to fight to find ways to get into the bookstores and to get in front of readers. And, you know, you are going right to the heart. You know, the, the cons are exactly the type of people, the, the audience that is going to want to read your, your style and, and what you bring to the table. How did, exactly. you, how did you come up with the idea of making these twists on, on nursery rhymes? You know, it's hard to say, really. Um, ideas just kind of come to you. Um, but the whole nursery rhyme thing actually started as an accident. So there's this old movie that has um, Shelley Duvall and Howie Mandel in it, and some others like Woody Harrelson and even Cindy Lauper. It was made in the 80s, and it's called Mother Goose Rock and Rhyme. Um, it was a movie I watched as a kid growing up. And I think one time it was on TV, and me being the nostalgic junkie I am, I you know put it on. And it was actually during haunt season. So at the time I was thinking about horror and scary things. And I made the joke to myself, wouldn't this be so much better if it were horror stories? And then bam, it, I just started coming up with ideas right there on the spot. And it, it, it amused me at the time. I had no idea I was going to turn it into something, but I did. <laughs> Thanks, Shelly Duvall. Right, right. And I hadn't heard of that one. And I'm a, you know, a old movie junkie myself. And I'm just a movie junkie. It doesn't have to be old. Um, but, with uh, uh, getting dressed as your characters, like I said, you know, it's a it's a really great idea, especially at the conventions, because it draws people to your table um, and gets gets them to know about your book. Um, how did the has a great pause affected you as far as writing or creativity? I mean, I'm not going to lie. Uh, the loss of events, uh, conventions and book signings. I had one for Barnes and Noble. Of course, those all being canceled and put off that definitely hurt uh, hurt a lot of us actually and so right. we've been relying on these uh, virtual cons and virtual events and just ways to promote ourselves online and I think the, I think the more virtual conventions are happening now as a result of cybercon which was the first one that I did so I think that if there's going to be a catch on there and I don't think they're going to necessarily replace conventions right. i think that they are just going to be an add-on i think they're going to be something a little bit extra to get from it there are going to be more ways for people to be involved now and i think it's going to be a win-win I, I completely agree you know we ran uh geek insider or uh, geek out virtual con and uh at the beginning of the month and we have a uh, uh, the independence con which you can follow independencecon.com everybody um which is going to be the the week first the weekend after independence day and then we're doing one in October. And that has been our plan the entire time is not to replace the brick and mortar cons. You know, we want to be back at the brick and mortar cons ourselves, uh, but to, to complement them, to hopefully even live stream from those events. And, you know, because we love the cons just as much as the next person. That's where we meet a lot of great people like yourself and where we get to be uh, introduced to a lot of new materials. You know, that's where I found all kinds of comic books was at the, the cons. And there being on the, you know, the, the worldwide pause, it is making things a lot harder for everybody across the board, from the writers like yourself, to the artists, and even way up, you know, to the DC and Marvel guys, because they haven't been putting out anything for the last few weeks. And those folks weren't set up to where they could work from home. Um, right. As somebody said at, at CyberCon, you know, or no, they said it at, at Geek Out Virtual Con, that now is our time. You know, now is the independence time. We've been preparing for this. We, uh, you know, most of us have been working from home for, for a long time. And um, I know, uh, uh, Oh, I forget which one said it, but they said, you know, if you didn't come out with something written during this time, then it's your own fault. You know, you, you can't say that you didn't have enough time when you just <laughs> all you had lately is time. Um, have you found yourself being more creative during this time or, or spending a lot more time, you know, throwing out ideas? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's the only silver lining to this crowd is this time. The one thing that us creative types, I've been longing for, you know, in our, in our, in our daily job routines and our daily schedules. Um, I try to spend a lot of time writing as much as I can, of course, to have some sort of finished product, to have some sort of draft. I'm working on a couple of manuscripts at a time. I figure if I get some done now, 
it'll be better for me in the long run. And I'm, I'm grateful to have that time. I, I hear you. I, I need to be uh, more, uh, I need to be taking advantage of the time more <laughs> instead of being on this computer all the time. But do you think that, that Megacon Orlando is going to happen in June? And if yes, really are you going to be so. there? I really, really hope so. I mean, a lot of conventions are, of course, having some penciled in dates. Um, I see a few that have already been changed multiple times. So it's difficult to make a commitment at this time for both them and us. I think everyone's right. just kind of, I hate to say it, waiting until the last minute to see what's going to happen. But of course, in the event that Megacon uh, happens in the date that it's going to happen, I will go uh, and I will go to other ones that are going to happen later as well, including Spooky Empire's dates that have pu been pushed from May to August. So, you know, you're in the Florida area. You hit a lot of the Florida cons. Which one has been your favorite con? Spooky Empire, hands down. Spooky Empire is the, the biggest horror convention in the Orlando area. It is so big that they do it twice a year now. Uh, the one in October, obviously, is in October. But they have another one in the spring. And it used to be called Mayhem, I believe, because it used to be during May. But since then, they have branched out and had it from March to, March to um, May. So there, there is a spring spooky empire as well as a fall spooky empire. And uh, this convention, um, as, I, as I've been told, since I haven't been in the area very long, this convention is more like a community. It is more like a family. A lot of the people there that I've, I've met are professionals in the horror industry and I've made a lot of friends there. So it's a lot about networking as well. You see people outside the convention and the convention is what always brings us all back. Very cool. Do you prefer the, the bigger cons or the smaller cons? You know, I, I, like, I like them both for different reasons. So I like the big convention because it allows me to wander aimlessly. The big conventions are where I go in character to just, just be free to wander, to mingle with the people, to meet the people and promote myself. And the way I like to go is unsupervised, of course. <laughs> now, the smaller conventions... I like to be a vendor at because if you're if, if more vendors are participate in the smaller conventions then the more than they can grow also gives me a chance to actually talk to most of the people there because they're smaller yeah that I, i've noticed you know the the bigger cons are great as far as being able to see celebrities and stuff like that but the smaller cons are so much better as far as networking, as far as finding, you know, that, that cool new artist that you fall in love with or that cool new writer that you fall in love with because they can afford those. The, the booths at some of the bigger cons are just crazy expensive. Yeah, they definitely are. People often ask me, why don't I get a, a table or a booth at the bigger conventions? And I like to tell people I'm my own walking booth at the bigger ones. At the smaller ones, though, you're right about the networking thing, especially if you are in the like the artist alley where most of other people like you are. You, you can meet people. It's the best way to do so. You talk to the people that are next to you, across to you, a little ways down there, and you meet some really nice friends in the industry. You can learn a lot from a lot of people at the smaller cons, I think. It gives you more time to talk to them. Exactly. And, and you know, there are so many of them that are willing and, and happy to share their knowledge of what they've learned from the various cons and letting you know which ones are really good to go to, or at least in their experience, you know, the ones where they did more than just break even and, uh, and they got, you know, uh, the, the, uh, well, the networking, it just, it's so much more, I don't want to say friendlier because the bigger cons are still friendly, but yeah. the, I don't know. It just seems to be able to be a lot easier to talk to people, especially in Artist Alley or in Authors Alley, and that you can just uh, easily pick conversations up as opposed to having to fight your way through. Um, Jackie, when when did you begin writing and figuring out that that's what you wanted to do, and was your family supportive of it? You know, it it, it found me. Writing chose me. I think I started at a very, very young age. I remember I would uh, sneak into my parents' office and steal the, the paper that they had for the printer. You know, it would disappear and they knew it was me. Oh, there goes Jackie. <laughs> she stole it and she's writing another story about, you know, mermaids or something. I don't know. <laughs> and then as I got older, they started to see me doing it more and more. And 
our neighbors and family would joke, oh, Jackie's probably in her room writing. She's probably writing about us. So, you know, that's the thing when you you find your passion and you find your talent, uh, it, it starts young. And if it's meant to be, it's going to find you at a young age. I always believed in that. Yeah, you know, I, I had the same thing as, as a child. Um, I was always told that I was a good writer and I would write stories, short stories. And I actually found one a couple of years ago that I have no memory of writing. I can tell that I was a very young age when I wrote it. And then I'm reading through it and I'm like, you know, there, it's not good as is, but there's a story here. I could actually turn this into something. Um, and then, you know, I've got a million and one ideas up here, but I'm the world's worst procrastinator. There's always something else going on. Um, and I've got to, you know, it, I ask a lot of writers, um, you know, if other than saying, you know, put pen to paper or, or getting it out down on paper, what one piece of advice would you give the aspiring writer? We'll be back right after this. Check it out. MobileEdge.com has award-winning products with innovative features and edgy contemporary designs that empower you to look sharp and travel smart with your mobile tech. Your beloved, not to mention expensive gaming gear and mobile tech devices are an extension of you. So give them the protection and style they deserve wherever you go. Find them at MobileEdge.com and protect your tech with Mobile Edge. Bring it on. What one piece of advice would you give the aspiring writer? Don't beat yourself up if you have writer's block. It happens to everybody. You know, sometimes you have, uh, some writers have a schedule. Like I personally try to get a thousand words done a day and you sit down and you get out what you can. Um, but if you find yourself just staring at the screen for a while, that's okay. You'll hear this from a lot of writers. It is okay. You have to know when it's time to just, just walk away and don't feel bad about yourself because then that idea will still be in your head. You have that block and you're still going to be thinking about it for a while and you never know what is going to trigger it uh, to get that in motion. Whether you're, you, you sit down to finish watching your favorite TV show and a character says or does something on that TV show, then you're just like, that's it. That's it right there. I got it. So really it's kind of like a trigger warning. You never know when it's going to hit you. So sometimes it is necessary to walk away and don't ever worry about it. Don't beat yourself up for doing that. It's normal. Yeah, very much so. And I have found that if I try to keep staring at that blank page, the block just gets bigger and bigger. But if I can trick my brain and, and go do something different, like you said, you know, concentrate on something else, just let the, the, the lizard brain go to work. Um, then usually the, the it'll come to me. And I usually have eight to 10 different copies of pages open up at any given time because I'm either throwing down an outline or working on an outline or, you know, and I've had to start making sure that I do outlines because too many times I have pulled up a document and there'll be, you know, a thousand words written and I have no freaking clue where I was going with it. I say this is a good start. But what did I have in mind here? And so <laughs> yeah. that's one thing. And Meredith is, is the world's worst about doing outlines. And so um, after the two cons and speaking with so many writers, she has become one that is trying to do more outlines herself. Um, so, um, and now, when uh, can you give us any insight to what you're currently working on? I'm actually currently working on a few things. Now I have the, the collection, of course, uh, taking all the nursery rhymes and uh, retelling them as horror stories called, of course, semi Run, which is nursery rhymes backwards. And actually, I can actually show off that label right here. This is, yeah, uh, this is Little Dog Laugh. This is my current title based off Hey Diddle Diddle. It's a vampire story, but I'm gonna show you my logo here. So semi is is here. Now it is, of course, nursery rhymes backwards. So I had my logo designed so that if you hold it up to a mirror, you will see that it says nursery rhymes. Now I did that because I wanted it to have a little bit of a, like a red rum effect. I wanted it to come across as, as just something that's off-putting and sinister, but people will know what it is, you know, instantly. They'll know why it is the way it is. So can you say that five times fast? Semi-res run, semi-res run, semi-res run, semi-res run. My res run. Uh -oh. what's, what's gonna come out of the mirror now and kill me? Right, <laughs> Candyman, Candyman. Or, or Bloody Mary. 
Um, or maybe I'll right? come out of your mirror. Now I that mean. would be, you know, the backwards you that would come out, or it could be, uh, what was it? That character, you know, uh, that <laughs> that's my buddy. That that one is uh, Batoni, Italian for buttons, and uh, he is actually in a short story that I did. I have a couple of uh, horror anthologies I'm in. Uh, that story is called Batoni, and it's in Carnival of Fear. That one is about a a puppet who's brought to life with a an evil spirit in him, and he goes on a killing spree. And this particular photo was taken at Spooky Empire a, a couple of years ago when I won Best Craftsmanship in the costume contest. Oh, and, very cool. Yeah, and it was actually the same weekend uh, that the anthology was published. So it, it just worked out beautifully for publicity. It's like, okay, all right, I'll go buy it. Here it is. It's for sale. <laughs> it, was, it was a great weekend for me. Very cool. And, and you've got such great costume ideas. You know, I, I showed, uh, showed some of them earlier. Um, how long does it typically take you to create one of the costumes? Is it completely varied, you know, um, or does it take you a few weeks? I would say a little bit longer than that. It, I mean, it really depends on like my schedule, what I'm doing, you know, what's behind it, how, how simple of a costume it is versus how detailed the costume is. Now I'm always working on the story piece at the same time because I, I need those to go together. Now, most of the time I will, work on the costume first and then add in the specific character descriptions later because for me it's a lot easier to describe what i've already made versus trying to fabricate what i've written you know right so the whole thing with the whole thing with mary's mouth mouthpiece came when i was trying to imagine okay well what would make her look as unsettling as possible so that's when i came up with that because as a costume she's going to look terrifying and so then i wrote it into the story but I already had her her character, what she looked like in mind while I was writing it and while I was creating her costume. Which one of your stories was the, the scariest and or most fun to write? Um, I would have to say, now, The Lamb Was Sure to Go obviously has the whole foreboding, the whole antichrist, the uh, pre-apocalyptic pre uh, themes in there, which are very common in horror. But I have to say My Soul to Keep has its moments as well because it's a, it's a, it's a paranormal. A lot of people like a good ghost story, and it's also based on real life events too. So once once I tell people that, they're they're a little off put and they get creeped out by it. And I got an email from someone saying that she didn't want to finish it at night because there was a bird by her window and it freaked her out. Oh no! And it made me laugh. Right, right. I was like okay, I think I think I did my job. All right, Jackie. Can you uh, hear me? Tell, yeah, I can hear you. Tell everybody where they can, I can find hear you. You see me? Yeah, I can see you. There's my website, of course, and scrolling here. Facebook is Starberg. Uh, you started breaking up again, Jackie. Um, well, hopefully that catches up real quick there. You can find her on Facebook under author Jackie Sonnenberg, on Twitter and Instagram at, at Sonnenbooks, or her website, JackieSonnenberg.com. Um, and the uh, one thing that I wanted to point out was that the uh, oops, the characters that, that she plays, folks, is, you know, the characters out of her books. But these are based on nursery rhymes that we all grew up with. But you probably didn't hear the, the, the real tale, like Cinderella. Um, and there's so many others that the grim fairy tale is not what disney brought to the table and jackie is taking an, the the uh, a lot of these fairy tales to even a further extreme than what the grim uh fairy tales did uh jackie are you back with us now or are you we no it looks like i lost her yeah i can hear you can you hear and see me no i can hear you but i can't you're no i'm here okay I think you're a little lagged out though, because it's taken several minutes or several seconds for you to hear what I'm saying. All right. All right, folks, just bear with us just a minute. Jackie will reconnect and get uh, that straightened out. And then I will be right back. Mm -hmm. We'll be back right after this. Check it out. MobileEdge.com has award-winning products with innovative features and edgy contemporary designs that empower you to look sharp and travel smart with your mobile tech. 
your beloved, not to mention expensive gaming gear and mobile tech devices are an extension of you, so give them the protection and style they deserve wherever you go. Find them at MobileEdge.com and protect your tech with Mobile Edge. Bring it on. And if you go to Mobile Edge and make a purchase, be sure to enter in code GEEK25 to get 25% off of your purchase. And as you can see, and I didn't even do this on purpose, I am wearing the Mobile Edge shirt and uh, just happened to be the one I grabbed out of the closet today. But Jackie is back. Let's see if we can get the audio. The video looks to still be messed up. Jackie, talk to us. Can we hear you now? Okay, hi. I'm, I'm back. All right, you are back. So can you hear me? Yep, you're just a little delayed, um, but we can go ahead. We can finish this up. Um, are there any of your characters that you hate to love? That I hate to love? Oh, I love all of them. I always will. They're fun. When you've gone to the bigger cons in costume without getting a vendor's table, have you ever been chased out as you're passing out flyers or business cards? Uh, Meredith is kind of scheming for the next con, I think. <laughs> well, I think the big thing about me is that I'm, so I look very, very young. Um, so oftentimes I've actually had security follow me because they thought I was a, a kid running around without adult supervision. <laughs> <laughs> but never ran out for, for advertising without a booth, right? All right. Mm -mm. Nope. Well, <laughs> this has been great, Jackie. I really appreciate you sticking around and, and uh, re-recording re this. Um, and we got almost all the way through it this time without the, uh, the issues there. Like I said, folks, with so many people working from home and doing various video conferencing, the Internet has these glitches all the time now. And, uh, but we wanted to make sure that we got Jackie on the show because, you know, she's definitely falls into the category of geeky, cheeky, and downright freaky. Um, we're going to have her back in July for the Independence Con, and then we're definitely going to have her in October for the, uh, the Night of the Dread concert, uh, concert, the Night of the Dread Con. And so we'll be announcing that date uh, at a future time. We're waiting to see about the world opening up and the worldwide pause ending. Um, so that if the real co the brick and mortar cons are going on, we don't want to compete with them because as Jackie and I were saying earlier, we want these virtual cons to kind of go hand in hand with the uh, brick and mortar. But as you can see, guys, there's her book, Little Dog Laughed. You can find her on Amazon. Check them out. Pick it up. Let her know what you think. And then if you get her in the Florida area, go buy the cons. She's going to be at MegaCon if it it's happens. It's both an ebook and a paperback. Beautiful. Well, I'm going to have to order the, the paperback version and uh, maybe I'll uh, get you to sign it or, and uh, have Meredith send it to me. All right. Well, Jackie, thanks so much again for joining us. Hopefully you got something out of that. Yeah, we're good to go, Jackie. Thanks so much. Folks, be sure you tune in next week and why you should already be well aware that there are aliens that have visited us. And so be sure to tune in for that. See you next week, folks. Thanks so much. Thank you for tuning in to Geeky, Cheeky, and Downright Freaky with Matthew Harris. Join him every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Eastern, 6 Central. This is a Geek Insider production. For advertising opportunities, contact advertising at geekinsider.com. Once again, we want to thank you for tuning in. You can listen on iHeartRadio, iTunes, Spotify, and Podbean. And if you're tuning in on YouTube, hit the subscribe button, because if you don't, you might have to turn in your geek card. <laughs>